Good morning and welcome. My name is Tom White and on behalf of Cleveland Moor, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to be involved in this project. With our wealth of experience in managing a range of proposals for a broad client base, we hope to be able to guide you to a successful outcome in managing your asset. This presentation will last for 15 minutes and is aimed at addressing two key areas that need to be considered from the very outset of this project. Firstly, to confirm our understanding of the project brief, in your role of facilities management for the university, you have a core responsibility to ensure that the institution's asset and property stock is adequately maintained and put to use. As a result of the library relocating to the new Stockwell Street building, a requirement has now arisen to appraise the possible future use or uses of the Dreadnought building, which is located within the grounds of the old Royal Naval College. As mentioned, the focus of this presentation will be on two specific areas. Firstly, whilst being mindful of your knowledge as client, the requirements of a feasibility study will be explained and expanded upon, with the benefits of undertaking such a task highlighted. The undertaking of a feasibility study is a critical stage in the early development of the project, as it will likely determine the project's direction by determining viability of proposals. Further to that, we will also address the historic nature of the building, and in particular the site on which it sits, highlighting it as being the dominant aspect of this project. As you are aware, there are various legislative constraints attached to both the building and its surroundings, restricting what is acceptable in terms of alterations and proposed development. Their influence on any proposal cannot be emphasised enough, and there are serious legal penalties for ignoring them. The building itself also has a rich history, derived from its surroundings and location on the river. It had been in maritime related use for over 200 years when you took occupation in 1998. It then underwent extensive renovation and conversion works in order to facilitate the use that you required. It served this purpose as a library for almost 20 years in various stages from then on. Now, with the relocation of the library to the Stockwell Street building and the internal spaces mostly vacated, the building's future use is being put into question. As you are no doubt aware, a largely unoccupied and unused asset has little, if any, value in terms of its contribution to your objectives. In fact, if not reviewed and addressed as a priority, it is likely to become a burden and detrimentally affect your full potential to function. We know that you understand the gravity of this as you have approached us for input in addressing it. We also understand that within your area of operational responsibility, you have a commitment to ensure your assets and facilities are appropriately maintained, to enable them to fulfil their present adapted purpose of supporting education. It is clearly therefore a priority of yours to address this immediate and future use of the historic building. In this responsibility towards the building, some fundamental questions will, ask, will be asked to begin the analytical process, two of which are likely to be, how are we, how are we able to reach a conclusion on how best to utilise this asset moving forward, and how can we ensure that the chosen use is successful in delivering or contributing towards our operational objectives? In order to address these questions, we would advise that a conclusive appraisal of the possible uses be carried out to determine what alternative function the vacated spaces can serve. In its objectives, this appraisal will need to consider, among many things, the potential viability, practicality and sustainability of the potential future uses. It would also explore how it would interact and whether it is reflective of your needs and longer term objectives. The most recognised and efficient way to carry out this process is to undertake a feasibility study. This task provides a vehicle to identify, analyse and evaluate the subject matter in extensive detail, 
such a methodical approach is necessary to ensure that the study is thorough in its content and adequately addresses the brief through critical analysis of the subject. A study of this nature can be undertaken for a variety of reasons, but with one constant, to examine the potential of a proposal in order to inform future decision making. From a technical perspective, a feasibility study is a tool which through analysis and evaluation will provide both you as client and us as consultant with a comprehensive understanding of the current situation, the viability of potential proposals and then convey a justified conclusion. However, the supporting conclusion may not necessarily agree with the proposal and may in fact contest the suitability and successful implementation of it. Importantly though, a primary objective of a feasibility study is to appraise particular areas that will exert influence on the outcome and in turn have a pivotal role to play in whether the proposals are viewed as viable or not. For example, key matters to consider include financial, legal and logistical parameters together with your organisation's objectives, all of which must be supportive of the proposal in order to be viewed as suitable and achievable. Furthermore, the study must consider and be largely aimed towards the various stakeholders that will be associated with the project, including those who will occupy the building, students, those who will manage and maintain the building, yourselves, together with the Greenwich Foundation and the ORNC charity, and those who will be affected or come into contact with the works in order to facilitate this use, community groups and local public. The study should follow a process of first identifying the non-variables, which is the historical and current use. These are facts and therefore straightforward to address. The first stage of the process will place the requirement for study in context, and by doing so, will portray an understanding of how the current requirement for change has developed and arisen. This early objective of the study is critical as it sets the scene and establishes a base from which to consider progression. Once these non-variables have been determined, identification and analysis of the proposals can be undertaken. Depending on the nature of the subject and wider considerations of how the proposal will coincide with current arrangements and objectives, the complexity of this second task can vary significantly. Evaluating and reviewing the analysed objects, subjects is a decisive stage of the study as it allows the persons undertaking the task to clearly state their interpretation of what the analysis have revealed. Due to the weight of this on future decisions, it can be a complex, lengthy and exhaustive process requiring absolute confidence in its reasoning, which itself is derived from a methodical approach and process which is followed from the outset. Furthermore, the required level of detail and depth of analysis to be carried out will be dictated by your expectations of what the study will deliver. For instance, a scenario and a particular brief may be to prematurely explore an organisation's expansion into a new market, with no immediate plans to take action from the study's conclusions. Effectively, the purpose of this brief is to provide the client with an expanded understanding of what could be possible rather than what is possible at that time. However, an alternative in your case, the brief is derived from a need to address the issue with some urgency in order to mitigate disruption to the university's deliverables and so that they can, you can efficiently resource the asset. This will in turn necessitate a greater level of emphasis on detail as the conclusions will have a substantial input towards immediate decisions and actions taken thereafter. Okay, so having covered the requirements of this feasibility study, the reasons for undertaking the task and the beneficial knowledge that can be gained from it, we now focus on the site and the various legislative constraints. The history and subsequent significance of the site on which the building sits means that the legislative restrictions that are in place are further reinforced and more stringent to what would normally be encountered elsewhere.
whilst you are aware, but just to confirm, the building itself is Grade 2 listed. The old Royal Naval College sits in its entirety, along with its extended surroundings, within a World Heritage Site. Additional to this, the entire area of the site, below ground level, is listed as an ancient, a scheduled ancient, ancient monument due to the remains of a Tudor Palace of Placentia, an Anglo-Saxon cemetery, and a 17th century undercroft. These listings and classifications are arguably the biggest factor to address in this project. Firstly, let's discuss the Grade 2 list status of the building. To begin with, it is important to say the least to understand what is entailed in addressing this in relation to any proposal that is put forward. Listed building consent will need to be obtained from the local planning authority under the Town and Country Planning Act 1990 Part 3. Listed building consent needs to be obtained for any internal and external alterations and therefore it is a criminal offence to proceed with an unauthorised works for a listed building without obtaining consent. Separate to this is building control. Local authority building control enforce compliance with the building regulations under the Building Act 1984. The building regulations cover all building works and are concerned with things such as fire safety, acoustics, drainage and electrical works. A building regulations full plans approval will need to be obtained from the local authority is strongly advised that works are not commenced until this is in place in order to avoid potential retrospective replication works. There are minor exemptions attributed to listed buildings and World Heritage sites where it has been agreed that by insisting on compliance with certain aspects of the building regulations, namely Part L, energy efficiency, the character and appearance of the building would be unacceptably altered. Taken in context of the wider picture in relation to listed buildings, where more stringent rules and procedures are present, this is a rare move in the opposite direction by accepting compromise in light of the effects it would have on the building. As you have already confirmed to us, there is asbestos present in locations around the building, which is undisturbed and controlled in its current state. Should we be appointed on this project, we would first ask you to provide a copy of your asbestos register for us to review. We would also inquire on the availability of a refurbishment and demolition survey. And if not in possession of one, advise that one be carried out at the earliest opportunity. Based on the results of this survey, the HSC may need to be notified in connection with the proposed works. Another requirement from a, from a legal perspective relates to the lease which you currently have, which I understand expires in 2148, after 150 years. Under law, the landlord needs to be consulted and approve of any proposed alterations to the fabric of the building prior to their implementation, with the lease am then amended accordingly. This is not particularly my area of expertise, and I will therefore refrain from going into detail and will instead consult with a colleague of mine who will be able to advise you on your legal obligations in this regard. In addition to listed building consent and building regulations approval, there will be a requirement to engage in consultations and cooperation with English Heritage throughout the project. They will have significant input in the planning process, liaising with the local authority. As current tenants of the building, you have a responsibility, in cooperation with the Greenwich Foundation, to maintain the building to prevent its dilapidation and potential fall into disrepair. <coughs> The local authorities and English Heritage's involvement will introduce additional stakeholders to the project, expanding the network of communication and increasing the requirement for efficient management in this respect. Additionally, and although not really a legislative requirement, there are various community and action groups active within Greenwich who keep a careful eye on any proposed works and whose voices and views hold weight and influence among those in the area. Consultation and discussion with these groups is essential, if not to gain support to solely inform and consider. To conclude this presentation, we'll quickly summarise on two areas of focus. Firstly, we have explored the requirement for and purpose of undertaking a feasibility study on your project. There are numerous benefits to be gained in taking this approach, none more so than the level of insight that it would give you in better understanding the current needs of your organisation. The sustainability and viability of proposals to address the needs, and lastly, providing you with a conclusive advice on how to proceed in order to deliver this proposal. Secondly, we've reviewed a number of legislative constraints that are present, attached to the building itself and the site on which it sits. <coughs> we reiterate that these legal attachments are critical to the project, 
and will need to be fully addressed at an early stage due to the duration of the consideration they need to be given. Once the proposal is finalised, statutory approvals will then need to be obtained from the local planning authority, list the building consent and then building rates. Whilst consultation is ongoing with English Heritage throughout this process. Thank you for your attention this morning. We hope the presentation was informative and has given you a fairly comprehensive understanding of the issues that need to be considered during this project. Should you have any questions or wish to clarify anything, I will be more than happy to receive those queries. We are, of course, very interested to be further involved with your project and look forward to hearing from you very soon. Thank you.